All right, we're restarting. Uh, I restarted the video. Hopefully this is a, a better feed. The sound was messing up there. I'll wait here a minute to, to see if someone acknowledges. All right, see Amber's there. Uh, is it, is it, how's the sound, Amber? Or Mary? I don't think she's online yet. Is this sounding okay? Somebody give me a, a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Hopefully our video is good. Okay. Thank you, Amber. And maybe it was, uh, I'm using Mary's phone because my phone is old and decrepit, sort of like me. All right, Mary says it's better. Amber says it's better. Let's begin our morning worship service. Uh, glad you are here for our Camp Creek Community Church uh, morning worship service and uh, thankful for each one that's able to join us this morning. And we do want to um, uh, have a word of prayer as we begin this morning. Uh, uh, from what I understand, um, uh, there's another uh, hurricane, major hurricane bearing down on Central America. I know that our, um, uh, our friends in the Philippines, our missionaries there, uh, they just went through a really rough one. Uh, I know that uh, Brother Nixon, he has some family that's, that's um, isolated from the, from the floodwaters and uh, Brother Manuel and some others. There's some devastation. There's been some damage there. So let's remember our missionary friends and, uh, and those around the world and even in our own country. And of course, remembering all that um, is happening in our country right now with the uh, in, uh, with the pending election results and, and just every everything that we have. You know, um, worry about nothing, pray about everything. Rejoice, give thanks, and pray. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and, uh, and we'll begin. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, this glorious day. Thank you, Lord, that, uh, that when I restarted the phone just now, that the, that the video and the audio came in good. Uh, I, I, I don't take that for granted, Lord. I, I know how easily this service can be disrupted with uh, technology issues. So thank you, Lord, for giving us uh, this uh, opportunity. And uh, Lord, I do pray you would be with our, uh, our, our Filipino uh, missionaries and their families uh, as they struggle, uh, the, the, those that have faced earthquakes and the, and the fires that's out in California and the, the, and the hurricanes and tsunamis that are bearing down uh, or, or the typhoons and the earthquakes or hurricanes that are bearing down in different places, Lord, just I pray you would be uh, with each one for the uh, the virus, and I, I know here in West Virginia, uh, there's been a, a, a steady increase in cases, and there's just there's just been a lot of uh, concern, Lord. And uh, Lord, uh, we don't have all the answers, and um, and I know even my own heart is torn about as we continue to have uh, services online, and and I know others are having them in house, uh, Father. Uh, just give us a peace and give us clear direction and let us see that you are at work uh, always in all things uh, in our lives. And Lord, I pray you would, um, you would even as, as these that are watching have these burdens on their hearts, Father, that you would, that you would hear and answer their prayer according to, to your will, just as you do in my life as well. Lord, strengthen your saints draw the lost to yourself and and answer uh, as you have uh, determined in your eternal purposes, Lord, and, and give us uh, strength and gratitude for all that you do, whether or not you you deliver us or, or whether or not you sustain us in the midst of, of difficulties. What, whatever the case may be, Lord, may we just trust you and glorify you. I pray that you would even now, Father, that you would remove Bill Sweeney uh, from from this from this service, Father. I, I, my desire in the Spirit is is to preach clearly Your Word without uh, any um, uh, interaction from from me, Lord. That it would just truly come from You, and 
that, that the flesh would just not get in the way uh, in any way at all. So, Father, have your way with this service. Thank you for these that are here. And we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bible this morning, <clears throat> open up to the Gospel of John and we will begin chapter 9 as we concluded chapter 8 the last Sunday. And I would like to read uh, the text. We're only, this is the miracle of the healing of, of the man that was born blind. And we're only going to look at the actual miracle this morning. We're going to look at verses 1 through 12. And then in the uh, uh, weeks to follow, we'll, we'll continue with the, the interaction that he has so with the man and with the Pharisees. So let's look at John chapter 9. And if you have your place, beginning at verse 1. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither has this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and watched and came seeing. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him that he was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and, back and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, How were thine eyes opened? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes, and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam, and wash. And I went, and washed, and received sight. Then said they unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Last Sunday, uh, we... The, the the great climax of chapter 8 was in, in verse 58 of John chapter 8. Jesus made the great proclamation that he was the great I am. That he was the one and only I am, uh, referring back to Exodus 3.14. Jesus Christ is saying, he said, I am eternal God. Uh, he didn't say... Uh, before Abraham was, I was. He said before Abraham was, I am, meaning he was always present. He never had a beginning nor an end because he is God. Um, and, and, and so uh, when he said that, they knew that he had just laid claim to being God himself. And so the Pharisees, believing he had blasphemed, took up stones uh, to stone him, and it says that he walked past them, and and uh, and they couldn't lay hands on him, and and he left he left the temple. So we we see this uh, Jesus Christ is the incarnate Word of God, and and the and the Word of God was hidden from the Pharisees. He was right before them, and God was before them, and they knew him not. Uh, so their words were hidden from Jesus and Jesus, when they sought to kill him, was hidden from them and, and from their intent to stone him. And we know that, that they continuously tried to kill him and the scripture tells us it was, his hour was not yet come. Jesus came to die, but he was going to die at a certain time in a certain place and, and this was according to the will of God, and it was the plan of salvation, and it was at a certain time that he would uh, die for our sins so that we uh, would be redeemed 
by his blood and uh, by, by his sacrifice on Calvary. He completed the work that God gave him to do. He cried from the cross, it is finished. The work is completed. The, the work of salvation is completed. But until that time, they could not touch him. Um, and so that ends, and, and we come to verse 9, and, and it says there in that first phrase, and as Jesus passed by. Uh, now, <clears throat> We, we know that chapter 9 is on the Sabbath day because if you look at verse 14 of chapter 9, it says that it was the Sabbath when he made the clay uh, and opened the eyes of the blind man. Now, um, we had just completed in John 8. Uh, this is the conclusion of the Feast of the Tabernacles. This is the, like a fall festival. This is in the fall. In John 7, he had gone to the Feast of the Tabernacles, and, and it says in verse 37 that on the last day of the feast, uh, the great day, Jesus stood and said, If any man thirsts, let him come and drink. And, and, and we know that Jesus is the living water. Um, and then in, as John 8 begins, we see that Jesus had uh, departed to the Mount of Olives, and the next morning, he came back again to the temple. And this is then where uh, the the woman that was caught in adultery, and he went through that discourse with the Pharisees, and then it ends with him making the great I am statement. Now, I, I, I believe that the last day of the feast would have been that eighth day, the Feast of Tabernacle. You can read about this in Leviticus 23. It began and ended with the Sabbath day. So it was, uh, um, it was eight days and uh, uh from from sabbath to sabbath um but here we see the day after uh the events that that unfolded in in john chapter 7 there in in, in john 8 um this is also called the sabbath so i, I say all that because uh, i i do not know uh, whether or not uh, some commentators say that that last day the great day was the seventh day but then that means that this eighth day, this consecrated day, the Sabbath, would have been the day that all this took place with the woman caught in adultery. I don't want to, I don't want to bog you down with technicalities. I just want to point this out because I didn't, I didn't understand it, and I tried to, tried to uncover it, and I, and I still don't know for sure. But we do know that in John chapter ten, that that Jesus. Uh, is at the it's at the time of the feast of the dedication, which is winter time. So here he it has been the fall, the feast of the tabernacle. In John ten, we know that it'll be the feast of dedication, and then of course when you get in John eleven and John twelve, then we then we have the reference to the coming Passover uh, in the spring, and and when Jesus was going to die. So we are coming, regardless of when this uh, took place with the blind man, Jesus' time on this earth is fast coming to a, a conclusion. We are in the, the, last, uh, uh, you know, the, the last stretch of his earthly ministry. And Jesus knows that his time is short and that, he, and that it is coming to time that his earthly ministry uh, will end. So I, I said all that. Because, and regardless of whether or not that, that chapter 8 ends and chapter 9 ends, and it's exactly the same. And, and remember now that there's no chapters and verses uh, in the Scripture. So um, they were created, man, man inserted chapters and verses so that we could have the reference points. And I, and I thank God for those reference points. Because without them, it would be really difficult to navigate the Bible and to be able to share with others uh, as we navigate the Bible together. But you, when we see chapter 8 end, it says that Jesus, they took up stones to stone him, and Jesus passed by, and, and, and they couldn't touch him. He hid himself from him. And then the very next verse says that, and as he passed by, so uh, regardless of the time frame, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, John has put these two, this, this goes hand in hand. These are meant to be connected. The Pharisees, he passed by them because they were seeking to kill him and they, they, and they could not see him spiritually. 
And they had all the answers in front of them. They had the scriptures. And now he passes by. He leaves the temple. And, and here he's passing by. And he sees a man. A man that's outside the temple. A man that was blind from his birth. This is a man that's, that's never had eyesight. He's never physically seen. He's outside the temple. And, the, and the, um, uh, this point so much to our spiritual condition before Christ saves us, that we are outside the household of faith. We were children of wrath, even as others. God came to me. He, he, he passed by me. And, and he passed by you. He came to you. We weren't seeking God. He died for us when we were yet his enemies. He came and he sought us out. He sought this man out. Don't think this, this is just a, 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 an oopsie that, that Jesus was just walking by and he just stumbled across this, this blind man laying begging on the side of the street. No, this is an appointed time. Jesus purposely went by this man. Uh, you, you remember this uh, in, in John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman, Jesus went out of his way. He went through Samaria. He stopped at the well. He was there for a divine appointment. And, and, and here is a divine appointment that has, that, uh, that has been foreordained before the world was. And we're going to find out. <laughs> before this man was born, there was a purpose in everything that was happening here. And, and so Jesus, he passes by this, this man that, it, that is blind. That's a representative of our lost sinful condition and how hopelessly lost and blind in our sin that we are before Christ came to us. And so, and so he comes, he comes to, by this blind man and, 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 and his disciples, they see this man that's, that's blind and, and, and it says, they obviously, obviously they must have known, it said that he was blind from his birth. So they know that this man has never had his sight. Uh, and, and, they, and, the, and the disciples say, Master, who did sin that this man or his, who, who, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Do you, do you notice how uncompassionate the disciples are in this question. Here is a man that, that is suffering and he has been in this terrible state his entire life. And what do the disciples, what's the only thing that they can think of to ask? Whose fault is it, Lord? Did he do this to himself? Did his parents do this to him? What's the reason why he's, why he's like this? <laughs> Not like our compassionate Lord. I, I, the, the disciples, they did not have that full understanding. They did not have the Holy Spirit yet. And, and, and yet, and it, is a, and it is a question. You know, this is a, this is a great question uh, that, that, that really um, it's in the mind, I believe, of, of all people. Um, and, and the question is, um, does all suffering result from sin? Well, the answer is yes and no. You see, yes, uh, uh, Romans 5.12 says that as by one man, sin entered into, into the world and death by sin. And so, and so death has passed upon all men for all have sinned. We are all under uh, the sin curse. So yes, sin plunged all of creation into, into death, into sin, into suffering. But see, not all uh, that is suffering is purposed by God for judgment or for punishment or for, or for correction. See, just because um, somebody has a sickness or something, uh, something, an accident happens, it does not mean that God is, is, is uh, zapping that person, that, there's a, that there is a, a detrimental reason why this is taking place in that person's life. So uh, he, he can do that. And, and, God, and God does. I mean, with his children, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And we know that, 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 God, that God does uh, uh, judge wicked men. And God, and God does rule in the affairs of men. And God does uh, 
bring, uh, bring judgment on, on some people. We don't understand this. Galatians 6, 7, and 8 says that be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. So if you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap corruption. If you sow to the spirit, you're going to reap life everlasting. Uh, and, and, and we know uh, it, Paul in his letter to the 1 Corinthians in chapter 11, there were some that were, um, that were abusing the Lord's table. And it says that many uh, were sick and some slept. People died. People died. Ananias and Sapphira died because they lied to the Holy Spirit when they said that they had sold the amount and given it all uh, to, to the church, which and they had not. It doesn't mean that they had to give it all to the church or had to give anything to the church, but they said that they did. They lied to God about it, and they were struck dead in the early church. So, so we know that God can move this way, and... and <laughs> And God can bring swift judgment. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We have lost so much of that today that we don't realize that God is a holy and a righteous God. He is all-powerful and almighty. And he can bring to pass the judgment and chastisement at any time. Um, don't think that God is asleep. Or that God doesn't care. He, sin cost him his only begotten son. It's not, it's, it's not something you sweep under the carpet. It's something that, his, that Jesus Christ died for. To, to, to purchase our salvation. To pay the penalty and, 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 and fulfill the wrath of God for our sins. Those of us who, the, who believe in him. And, and all of this creation, in Romans 8, we find out that we're, we're groaning under this body of sin because we're under that sin curse and that, and that even creation itself groans. You know, in paradise, there was none of this. There was no sickness and there was no death. All this came as a result of sin. So, so yes, in that aspect, we are, we're, we're, all, we're all under uh, the, the sin curse in, in this fallen world, and, and, and Christians get sick, and accidents happen to Christians, and, 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 so, uh, and so suffering does take place. But, but that, does, that does not mean that God is putting his finger on an individual and saying you, that you are, you, this is from this sin that you committed. And he sure ain't telling somebody else that, that I'm uh, sick or I'm dying or an accident happened to me, he's not, telling, he's not telling someone else, he's not telling my friends that, well, Bill, I'm zapping him. Uh, you know, no. Now, if, if, I'm, if God is chastening me, yes, I do believe that I know that. I have experienced the chasing hand of God. It's the loving hand of God. The same as when I was a boy and I sinned that, and, and, and I disobeyed my father and, and I received that punishment. It, it was necessary. It was necessary to correct me. And that's how it is with God and his children. And, 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 but there is a great question, and the question is in the world today. Yes, believers have these questions, but, the, but all, of the, all of mankind has these questions. It's, uh, they want to know, does suffering come from sins from a previous life? All the Eastern religions and this reincarnation and karma, and, and these are common words that we hear every day. And people think, well, yeah, well, did I, did I do something in a previous life? And why, are you, why are you after me? You know, these questions, these things are said. Um, it, or, or even sins from our past. And, and, and Christians, we, we have this difficulty sometimes, don't we? We're saying, well, well, because of what I have done in my past, is, is this, am I, is God punishing me for this? Or is this affecting my children because of what I did? Or even sins uh, from the womb? Or, you know, or, or, and, and as the disciples ask this question, they say, did, did, did my parents sin? Did this man's parents sin? Is that why he's suffering this way? And, and if you remember in John chapter 8, in, in verse 51, Jesus made that, that great uh, statement that said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my sayings, 
he shall never see death. And, and remember, we talked about this. Death is the elephant that's always in the room. Nobody wants to talk about it. Everybody's uncomfortable with it. Everybody knows that they're under a death sentence. One in one people die. Well, well, suffering falls under that same heading with death. It's something that's always present, and people understand that they're suffering. People understand that they get sick. People understand that bad things happen to good people and that terrible accidents happen that can't be explained. And so these questions, they're in believers' mind. They're in the lost world's mind, and they try, and like the Eastern religions, they've created all these ideas of, of, well, the, only, the reason why you're suffering like you are now is because something that you did in a previous life. And, and, and many people will say, well, you would be, wouldn't be, this wouldn't be happening to you if you hadn't have done something to cause this. And, and so uh, it, it, the disciples question, it, it's, it's the wrong question. Um, we know that, that the eyes of the Lord, Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3, 12 through 15, that the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers, but that the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Then in verse 14 of that, of that uh, chapter, he says, but and if ye suffer for righteousness sakes, believers, if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye and don't be afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God of your heart in your hearts and be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and in fear. So Christians, when, when we go through difficulties and when we go through suffering, what Peter is telling us is, is first of all, yes, make sure that, that, you are, that you are being punished because he says also, don't be punished for evil doing. You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not being uh, persecuted when the police officer pulls me over for speeding because I'm breaking the law. And Peter says, don't do that. Don't, don't be persecuted or don't be punished for wrongdoing. But make sure that you are, you are living for the Lord. And we can't do this perfectly. But he says that if you're, if you're living that righteously by the power of the Spirit and that you suffer either by persecution or even physical uh, difficulties, accidents, or ailments, anything that comes upon our life, that, that, we, are, that, we, have a, uh, that we always have the answer of the reason of the hope that is within us. See, it's this, uh, these that say that, that God wants you to live your best life now. That's, that is a lie straight from the pits of hell. Jesus Christ didn't, didn't die to give me everything that I wanted, all the candy I wanted in this life. He died that I may have eternal life. And that, and that one day I'm going to receive that body that will be perfect and complete and then I will glorify him for all eternity. And that's my purpose. Our purpose is to glorify God. And we're to begin this now. We're saved now. So we're to glorify God now in, in this life no matter what comes. And it's not about this life. We've already begun eternity. But it's just the beginning of eternity. And it's, it's not about what I have and what I, and, and what I can get in this life. It's what Christ has done for me and what awaits me. We're, we must look at this life in that eternal perspective of God, not in this little temporary, this, this vapor that the Bible says that appears a little while and then it's gone. You, you think, and, and, and there are those, and man, I get really I get really angry at, at these that, that preach this, that God wants you to have your best life now. Well, what about Stephen, who was, per, in, who was, he was clearly in the will of God when, when he preached uh, to the Jews and they stoned him to death and gnashed on him with their teeth? What about him? Was, was God, was that his best life now? No, no, because he saw Jesus stand at the right hand of the Father and he was absent from the body and present with the Lord. And then he began his best life now. It's not this life. 
And, and, and these yahoos that, that say, if you only have faith, you can be healed, they're taking the scripture out of context. It's, it's if you, if, what did Jesus pray? He said, Father, if it be possible, if it be your will, thy will be done. That's how we should pray. And the, the prayer of faith in James 5, 16, uh, that, that saves the sick. And, and, and yes, so we pray. And has God answered my prayer and brought healing? He has. But it has nothing to do with me. It was, it was by the, 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 the design and the purposes of God. And yes, God put that on my heart. And I do pray for other people. And we, we, we prayed through that other hurricane, that, that typhoon, to, to pass by the Philippines. And, and it did. But this one hit. Does that mean we quit praying? Does that mean we didn't pray hard enough the second time? No, don't you understand? God is in control of these things. And yet he does He does. Look for us to pray. He, he wants to hear our prayers. They're a sweet savor to him. Our praises and our prayers that go up to God. And, we pray, and we're to pray for one another. But, but just because God does not answer the, our prayers the way we pray them, that, that does not mean that we, that we have failed in our prayer. None of us are perfect. But these, but these rascals that say, well, if you have enough faith... Just name it and claim it. You can't do that. We are not God. It's in God's timing and in God's purposes. And he will hear and answer according to his will. And, and, and what do you think about the Apostle Paul? Uh, there in 2 Corinthians 12, when he said that he had that thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan that buffeted him. And it was to keep him humble that she, he should be exalted above measure. He prayed three times for God to remove whatever this, whatever this physical infirmity was that Paul had. He asked three times for God to remove it. And all three times, the answer came back, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. It was not God's will to heal Paul of this infirmity. It is not God's will, God's will for, for every child uh, to be healed uh, from MS or Down syndrome or whatever else there is uh, or, or cancer. We cry out to God. There's nothing that breaks my heart more than see a little one suffer. And, and, and I see that and I cry out to God, oh God, heal this child. But it's according to his will. We don't understand divine purposes. We don't understand his eternal purposes. We must simply trust him. Of course we pray for that. But it's, it's all in his hands. And was Paul not right with God? Three times. And it's amazing. God's answer came back the first time. My grace is sufficient for you. And, that, and Paul, this was something that was pressing on, on him. And he continued to pray this prayer. Three times he asked the Lord. And all three times God said, No, Paul. I'm not going to remove this burden from you because my grace is sufficient for you. And it, and it was God's purposes. And, and, and by the way, these that say that you ain't got enough faith and that's why you didn't get healed, you know, or that you have some sin in your life, sinners telling sinners that they have sin in their life and that's why they're not healed. Man, I would shudder to, to make that statement. You go read James 5, uh, 15 and 16 about the prayer of faith and the, and the anointing with oil. And if any man's sick, let him call for the elders and anoint with oil and lay hands up on him. And, 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 they, and many of people, they'll, they'll use this scripture as a, as a battering ram. And then when they pray and the person is not healed is because they're, they're not looking at it in the context of according to the will of God that they be healed. And then they say, well, you, you obviously have some other sin in your life, or you obviously have a lack of faith. Well, when, if, if, if you take that the way they interpret it, it says that the prayer of faith will save the sick. So the problem is not with my faith, it's with the prayers, praying person's faith. It's with your faith, pray healer, faith healer, that someone's not healed. If you take that literally, if you, you take that out of the context that you have been, and you're not looking at things in the will of God. It's your problem. It's not the person's problem that they are not healed. That's a bunch of nonsense. 
That's some nonsense. We see this junk on TV all the time. And you send me your money, and we're gonna, and you're gonna have your bank accounts full, and 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 God's gonna take away that cancer. And people that cannot afford to to give to these rascals, they send their money off, and that person has. He cannot determine the will of God. Thank God that they can't determine the will of God. Don't listen to that nonsense. Don't send them guys your money. Don't do it. Pray and trust God. Get in the word of God and realize that our best life is found in Jesus Christ and it's for all eternity. And this life is just a vapor. It appears a little while. So if God heals me of cancer, what about 20 years from now? What about 30 years from now? If you're 90, 90 years old and you're praying for God to heal your congestive heart failure, well, the rest of your body is 90 years old. So then what? How long is enough? How much is enough? You see, these bodies are temporary. Paul says that we must set aside this corruptible and put on incorruption. I know I've, I've gone way off, off track this morning. Yeah, but it, it's something that, that just... It eats me alive when I see this, and I know that people are being deceived by this. And all it does is increase their confusion, and people are taking advantage. Of these, these, these scoundrels are taking advantage of people that don't know any better. So Jesus, he answers this question. He said, oh, here you go. It was neither this man that sinned, nor his parents. It wasn't in no previous life. It wasn't in his, in, in his past. It wasn't what he did. It wasn't what his parents did. Look at this. It's that the perk, that the works of God should be made manifest in him. You mean there was a divine purpose in this man being born blind? Yes. That's what Jesus is saying. You remember Job and his, and, and them friends, <laughs> he calls uh, in, in Job 16, verse 2, he told his friends, because they said, man, you're, you cannot be going through all this difficulty, all this suffering, all this sorrow, unless you did something really, really bad, Job. They didn't understand the conversation that, that, that God had with, with Satan over, over Job and that this was a test uh, for Job. And they didn't see all this. Job looked at his friends and he said, miserable comforters are you all. We don't need friends like Job. I don't, I, we don't need somebody uh, that we, when, we have, when we're bleeding and wounded for them to stick their finger in the, in, the, in the cut and say, man, what did you do to deserve that? That's not what we need. We don't need that kind of, of uh, judgmental attitudes from other people. This man had a purpose, Paul. Remember Paul, he was a scoundrel. He was a murderer. He was on the road to Damascus to kill Christians. And God stopped him in his tracks. And, and actually, isn't it interesting he, that he struck Paul with blindness, Saul of Tarsus. He, he was blind. And, and Paul had two questions. He said, who art thou, Lord? And what would you have me to do? Paul didn't ask the question, why did you strike me with blindness? Why did you make me blind? He didn't ask that question. He acknowledged that Jesus Christ was Lord. And then he said, what would you have me to do? And it had nothing to do with whether or not he got his sight back or not. It was all about serving the Lord in that capacity that he had. That uh, Joni Eric, Erickson uh, Tata, I think is how you pronounce her name. Uh, she's on the Christian radio. And, and, and as a teenager, uh, she dove in, into shallow water and she broke her neck. And she's a quadriplegic. And she has no movement from her neck down. And yet she has decade after decade after decade, she has served the Lord in a capacity of, of inspiration and teaching and, and, and helping, uh, going into third world countries and helping people uh, that, that have these kind of debilitating injuries and, and, and um, uh, uh, dis diseases. And, and she helps them and, and, she, and she brings the gospel to them. She would never have done any of those things if this accident happened, hadn't happened to her. Now, I don't, I, don't wanna, I don't want to go through that. But what I'm saying is, is, is we just need to trust God with whatever circumstance we find in life. And, and, to, and no matter what the situation, to say, Lord, what would you have me to do? 
It's not why did this happen to me, but what do you, would you have me to do with this situation that you put me in? How may I glorify you in this? And I'm not trying to be ultra spiritual, <laughs> but by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do this. We can do these things. And one, and, and let me, uh, and I'll move on, but 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5, Paul addresses this when he says that uh, blessed is God uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of all comfort, who comforts us. Now, here, here's where the rubber meets the road. It's when, when God told Paul, I'm not going to heal you, but he said, my grace is sufficient for you. Listen to this. The God of all comfort, who comforts us, um, in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So God is preparing me in times of suffering and difficulty. Not only is he growing my faith, but he's also making me compassionate and tender for those that are going through difficult things, especially things that I have just gone through. Uh, a, a parent that has lost a child doesn't need to hear from some arrogant, uh, loud mouth that has never experienced any kind of heartache like that, but someone that has gone through those deep waters and have hurt beyond expression. And they have seen God comfort them in a supernatural way. Then yes, they could come up along beside somebody that's going through those deep, deep waters. And they could give them comfort. And since they've been through it, their, their, their compassion and, 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 and their understanding is validated to that person. Yes, this person has been through this. And then you can comfort others with the comfort you've been comforted with. So uh, I think I heard uh, John Piper say when he had cancer, he said, Lord, help me not to waste this cancer. Not waste it. I hope I, I, hope I got that right, uh, of who it was and all. But, but don't waste it. I'm going through this very difficult time. Lord, what would you have me to do with this? Don't let me waste this opportunity to glorify you and be a ministry to someone else. Wow. Uh, and so... Jesus says, this man was born this way because there's a purpose that, 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 um, that the works of God will be made manifest in him. Jesus was going to heal him. And so, and then in verse four, he says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is today. And one of those works was to heal this man because that was why he was born blind. Now, if it hadn't been God's will to heal this man that was born blind, does, does that mean he's any less God and he's any less compassionate as God? No, it's according to his divine and eternal purposes. <clears throat> and I don't understand all this. I just have to trust the one who does understand it all and, and is at work in all these things. He says, I must work the works of him that sent me, verse 4. While it is day, the night comes when no man can work. You see, Jesus knew his time on earth. It was limited. As I just said, fall, winter is approaching. In the spring, he's going to be crucified at the time of Passover. I mean, his, his time on earth is, is coming to an end. His time earthly time, that is, is running out as he was incarnate uh, God and he was going to die. And so his time is coming uh, to, to an end. His time on earth was limited in that capacity. Uh, and, and his purpose was to finish the work of the Father. And, and of course, that was ultimately uh, completed on Calvary when he died for our sins. And and this was all in Acts 2. Remember Peter's sermon when he, he told the Jews, he said, you know, that this Jesus that was, uh, that, that was here among you, that, that you, that he was delivered by the de determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, Acts 2.23, and, and you had have taken by wicked hands, have crucified and slain. But that God, that God raised him from the dead. 
So his time, his purpose was to die on that cross. And he says, I must do the works while it is day. The night is coming. And, and Christians, this is, this is for us to, this is for us today. Our time on this earth is limited. And no man knows the hour or day. We, we don't know when the Lord's coming. And we don't, we don't know when God will call us home. Because it's appointed unto man once to die. We have an appointment with death. And after this, the judgment. So, so we know our time is limited. And, and, as, and as our Savior, his time was limited on this earth. And he must do the works of God. This is for us to do. We must do the works of God because our time is limited. We are, as Paul said in Ephesians 5, 16, that we are to redeem the time because the days are evil. Don't waste your time. Make every moment count for the Lord Jesus Christ and count for all eternity. Jesus didn't sin in verse 5, and I know we must hurry. As long as I'm in the world, I am <clears throat> the light of the world. Uh, but you know what? He's still the light of the world. He was talking about his physical life and, and that light and how he, and then the word that became flesh and dwelt among us and we, be, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The glory of God shined in the life, in the physical life of the Lord Jesus Christ. But even after Jesus died, he's still the light of the world. And Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, the light that shined in the darkness has shined in our hearts to, re to give the glory of God in the, in the light of Jesus Christ, the face of Jesus Christ. We, we have the spirit of Christ that indwells us. And, 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 and uh, Jesus, he told, uh, he told his disciples in John 5, 14, you are the light of the world. A city that is, is set on the hill cannot be hid. We're, a, we're not to hide our light under the bushel. We're to let our light shine. It's not, it's not our light. It's the light of Jesus Christ in us. And we're to let that light shine. But he says, uh, I, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. And then when he had thus spoken, he, he, he spat on the ground. So, so here, here he is now. He's addressed the question uh, of his disciples. And now here is this man that was born blind. And, and, and he's still in the same condition. Uh, all, all the things that Jesus has said, this, <laughs> this hasn't changed the fact that this man is still physically blind. And so now Jesus, he, he spat on the ground and he made clay out of the spittle and, and, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And, then, and, and again, trees have been butchered uh, writing commentaries on what that meant. Don't get hung up in the method. Sure, uh, God made man out of clay, and, and, and here this man, he, he was, had a, a birth defect, and, and God is, is, is taking uh, the dust that man was made from, and, and he's spitting on it, and he's making clay, and, and, and we're just broken clay pots anyways. And, and so it was showing that, that God, in creation, he created man, and he's, he's, he's a new creation with this man's eyes, eyes that could see. And that the irritant, oh, you know, I, I thought about this too, and I, I read this, and I thought, well, that makes sense. You know, <clears throat> he, he was blind, but he still had feeling. And so uh, when you take uh, muddy clay and you rub it in somebody's eyes, that's going to that's gonna be an irritant to them. And, 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 and those that say, well, that, and this is a type of the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit and the conviction that the Holy Spirit brings us to make us miserable when we're in our sin or, or, or make the lost man uh, realize his sinful condition so that he would flee to, to the Savior. Okay, maybe, sure. Don't get hung up on, on methodology because he, he, he spat on the ground, he made clay, he put the, eye, uh, the clay on the blind man's eyes, and then he said, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. Remember, uh, <clears throat> in, in right here in verse 4, he says, I must work the works of him that sent me. So the father sent the son, and now, and now the son has taken this clay and put it on the man's eyes and he has sent him to the pool of scent. As it said, the interpretation is sent. So there's sending going on here. 
The Father has sent, has sent the Son, and now the Son is sending this man to the pool to, to rinse the clay out of his eyes. So, God, don't, and, I, and you, a few years back, they actually discovered this pool of uh, Siloam uh, that, that was in the time of Jesus, and they've unearthed it, and you can go to Jerusalem, you can see, you can see it. Okay, don't go, don't go there and, and go get some dirt in a road and rubbing in a wound or in your arthritis and, and go wash in, in the pool and think that there's some kind of magical, there's some kind of magical formula for that. No, it's the glory is in God. It's in the, it's in the Son of God, Jesus Christ, not the, not the methodology. He, he, he healed different people in different ways all the time. It's not the how that he did it, it's the who he was that did it. I, and so he does this, and it doesn't make sense, does it? Because the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. And, and we can't turn there, but in 2 Kings chapter 5, we, we, we read about the captain of the, of the host of the king of Syria, this Naaman, this great man, this great warrior, and he had leprosy. And they had taken children of Israel captive. He had a little slave girl from, from, from a, a, a little Jewish girl. They had been taken from Israel that waited on his wife. And, and this great man, Naaman, the Syrian, he has leprosy. And the little girl, uh, she says, Oh, if, if my master was in Samaria where the prophet of God is, he could help him. And so after a, a, the king of Syria sends correspondence to the king of Israel and they got all this pompous nonsense going on, finally Naaman goes in this great uh, parade of, of, of people and possessions and he goes to where uh, Elisha is in Samaria. Elisha uh, is in his tent and, and so this, this great entourage pulls up and Elisha just said, tells his servant, said, Go tell him uh, uh, to, to go wash uh, in the Jordan seven times. He didn't even come outside. And man, Naaman got ticked off. He's like, hey, I'm a great man here. You know, he, Elisha was supposed to come out of here. He's supposed to do that stuff I see the guys on TV doing. Do flip-flops and stuff and make great sayings and do dramatic things. He's supposed to do something special for me. What do you mean go wash? That these there's rivers in Damascus that are that are much cleaner than the Jordan. Why would I do this? And and his you can read this all for yourself. But his servant said, "Oh man, if 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 the man of God had told you to do some great thing, you would have done it instantly." But because he tells you to humble yourself and do something you don't understand, do something simple. Just go bathe. Just go wash yourself and dip yourself in Jordan seven times. And Damon conceded and he went and he did it and he was healed of his leprosy. Jesus doesn't make sense. Spits on the ground, makes clay, puts it on the guy's eyes. And he says, go wash. Go, go wash in the pool. And what did the guy say? Well, that's ridiculous. Why would I go and do that? Why did you put this stuff in my eyes? No. Jesus said, go. And he went. And, and, and so he went his way, therefore, and washed and came seen. And this is, this is a, um, an object lesson of what he had just taught in the previous chapter in John 8, verse 12, when he says, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Follow me, obey me, do, go where I tell you to go, do what I tell you to do. I'm the light of the world, and you'll pass from darkness into life, into light. So eh, remember the psalmist uh, David in his great sin with Bathsheba and Uriah. And in Psalm 51, he's crying out to God and he said, have mercy upon me, O God. And he, Nathan had exposed this sin to him and God will do that to us, won't he? He'll show us where we're wrong and he will correct us. And, 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 and he does chasten his children that he loves. And he was chastening David. And David said, oh, Lord, have mercy on me according to your loving kindness. Uh, uh, and the multitude of your tender mercies blot out my transgressions. Wash me from mine iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. And God did that. His child still died. There are consequences for our actions. And, and, and God... God can remove consequences, but he doesn't always do that. It does, 
but the, but the child was with the Lord. David the sword never left his house, but David had a cleansing of his soul. He had the forgiveness of sins, and his physical situation is not what was important. It was his soul that was important, and God cleansed his soul. And that's what he does to you and I today. A man that commits murder and is serving a life sentence in prison, if you, if you give your if you cry out to the Lord, you believe in Jesus, you repent of your sins, He will save you. He does save you. It does not mean that your life sentence is going to be revoked or, or removed or, or whatever that word is. It, it, you still very well might spend the rest of your life in prison. But guess what you have now? You have a prison ministry. Because you're a child of God in the prison. You're like Paul and Silas. You're in the prison. You're praising God and everybody's hearing them praise God and they've been beaten and they've been falsely in prison. Hey, glorify God. Man, where am I? Okay, so now uh, the neighbors, therefore, verse eight, the man's healed. And, and the neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him that he was blind. I think about our neighbors look, looking out their windows, and I do that too. Something's going on across the street, and you, you, look, you look out the window to see what's going on. <laughs> they, they knew this man. They knew he was born blind. And all of a sudden, he's walking around seeing. And, and, they, and they said, it's not him, this that sat and bag. Man, there's, this looks like the guy. And, 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 and look, again, his spiritual condition, all he could do was beg. He was blind. He had nothing else he could do. He couldn't, he couldn't come to Jesus. All he could did, do was sit and beg for mercy. <clears throat> and some said, well, this is he. Yeah, this is the guy. And others said, no, he's like him. It's just somebody that looks like him. It can't be the same guy. But here, the blind man now that can see, he said, no, 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 it's me. It's me, guys. I really am. I'm, I'm me. I was blind. I've been blind from birth. I never saw anything in my life. And, and hey, uh, you know, George, you're George. I recognize your voice. Now I see your face. Oh my, it's you. And he saw for the first time. He's seeing for the first time. And the people are just, they're not understanding all this. And, and, and when we're born again by the Spirit of God, it, it does create a change in us. And people, and a lot of times people will say, ah, oh, man, it's just a phase he's going through, right? Well, yeah, we'll see. Just give this time and see. Well, if you're truly born again by the Spirit of God, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We're, we're, he's, he's conforming us to the image of his Son. We're being transformed by the renewing of our mind. We're growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. Something happened to us, and we don't understand it, but we're, we're trying to learn and understand, and we're following Jesus the best we know how. And, and the more we follow him, the more we know, and then the more we follow him, and then the more we know, and we continue on this until we get to glory. And people are shaking their heads saying, what in the world happened to this guy? He's been saved. He's been born again. And therefore, they said unto him in verse 10, they don't understand what's happened to him. And so they say, how were thy eyes open? This is the first of four times that this question was asked. It's the wrong question. It's not how was your eyes open, who opened your eyes? That's the question. It's Jesus. And that's what he said. He said, a man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me to go wash in the pool. And, and, and I went and I washed and I received my sight. He didn't even know Jesus. You think about that. Jesus came to him just like he came to you and me as he came to the Samaritan woman. We didn't know him. We weren't seeking him. He came to me. When I could not come to where he was, he came to me. <clears throat> he did not know Jesus. He, and you know what? He couldn't even see Jesus make the spit. He didn't even know how Jesus made the clay. All he knew was a man rubbed clay on his eyes and that man's name was Jesus and he put the clay on my eyes, and he, and he sent me to go wash my eyes. And so I did what he said to do, and, and when I washed, I could see. I could see. Remember Nicodemus? How can a man be born again? Not how. Who? Who can make you born again? How can these things be? No, Nicodemus, who can make these things so? It's, it's Jesus Christ. 
Jesus Christ is the one that can make us born again. He, he is the one that, that makes blind eyes see, that makes deaf ears hear, that he, that he resurrects the dead. You hath he quickened or made alive who were dead in our trespasses and sins, made spiritually alive when we were dead. It's Jesus. That's who. That's who does it. And so there in verse 12, uh, he, he says, uh, they asked him, they said, well, where is he? And he said, I, I know not. Now, obviously, we're, we're going to have to do the Paul Harvey rest of the story here. He's, he didn't know how it happened. All he knew was is that it did happen. And he knew who did it to him. He didn't even, he, did, he only knew Jesus as a man. The word did become flesh. And Jesus Christ was a man. But he was all so much more than a man. Uh, and he wouldn't know him. Anyways, where is he? Well, even if he was there, that blind man wouldn't have known him, would he? Because he had never seen him before. I don't know if I said that right, Mom, but uh, he had never seen him before. Never saw anything. So how would he know where he was at? if he was there or not. But Jesus, he doesn't leave him this way, does he? Uh, you know, uh, Jesus is, is going to give him, and you can read ahead if you want, he's going to give him much more than physical sight. The most important miracle of all is the new birth, is to be born again. Again, the physical healing it was just an example. And yes, the man was suffering. And Jesus, with that heart of love and compassion, he healed the physical infirmities everywhere he went. And he, he showed the glory of God and the compassion of God. But, but all those people that Jesus healed, every last one of them, including uh, when we read about Lazarus uh, there in, in John 11, when he raised Lazarus from the dead. What happened to Lazarus at some point later in his life? He died again. He had to physically die again. It's not this life that's important. It's the spiritual life. And Jesus is not going to leave him with just physical eyesight. And, and that's, for, that's, for another, that's for another message. So, um, <clears throat> you, you know, if you don't understand and you don't understand anything. If you don't understand this, look, you're never going to understand anything about the Bible un until you believe that Jesus is who he says he is. That's all that you're ever going to be able to understand. And that's going to be by the power of the Spirit of God. And, and, and if you do understand and you hear that and you believe it, then, then obey his word. And when, he's, when he says go, then go. When he says, Cry, call, uh, um, uh, whosoever will may come and drink of the water of life freely. Come and drink. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Uh, it, call out to God. Cry out to him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Believe him. Try, take him at his word and, and, and obey him. And then, and only then, when you are born again, not how, but by who? By Jesus Christ. When you're born again, then, then and only then can you begin to grow and to understand. So that's why the, the writer of Hebrews tells uh, people in, in Hebrews 4, 7, today, if you, will he if you hear his voice, to harden not your hearts. Can you, do you hear his voice? Is what I'm saying to you is true and you don't know the Lord? If you hear his voice, then cry out to him to be saved. If, if, uh, if you hear him, trust him, obey him, and he will save you. Now, and this is in conclusion, you know, uh, uh, Peter tells us that uh, we are a, a, uh, a chosen generation believers, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Why? So that we should show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's in 1 Peter 2 verse 9. He's called us out of darkness into light. And, 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 and he's made us different. He's made us a child of the king. And, and, and then in his second epistle, 2 Peter 3.18, we are told, Peter tells us to but we are to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. We're 
to, to grow. That's so you and until you know him, you cannot grow in him. You're never going to grow in Christ. You're never going to learn about Christ until you know Christ. You can't get the cart before the horse. And if you if you know him, then and only then do we begin to know more about him and know what God did for us when he saved us. I want to I want to conclude with with this hymn and uh more about Jesus <clears throat> and, and believers. This, this, is, this, is, this is our heart today. This is our heart's desire today. And if you don't know the Lord, that how, you, how you get to this point to grow in that grace and knowledge of the Lord is, is to that there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And when you're born again, how can these things be? No, who can do these things for me? Jesus can. Call out to Jesus and he'll save you. And then as we know the Lord and we grow in the Lord, we can sing this song. More about Jesus, what I know. More of his grace to others show. More of his saving fullness, see. More of his love who died for me. More about Jesus, let me learn. More of his holy will discern. Spirit of God, my teacher, be showing the things of Christ to me. More about Jesus in his word. Holding communion with my Lord. Hearing his voice in every line and making each faithful saying mine. More about Jesus on his throne. Riches and glory all his own. More of his kingdom sure increase. More of his coming, the Prince of Peace. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. That's our heart. That's our prayer to know more about the one who saved us and, and not be distracted by anything uh, of this world, even with sickness and, and catastrophes and death and even elections that don't go your way. Oh, more about Jesus. More about Jesus. I love you in the Lord. Have a blessed day.